live that fantasy. I want to start by saying distinguished guests are here with us physically and online, colleagues from the World Bank, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as you may know by now, or many of you at least should have uh, been present in several of our previous updates, these World Bank Group economic updates are released twice annually to provide an overview of recent economic developments an economic forecast for the medium term and also to address a topical issue that's pertinent to the development of uh, Uganda. The aim of these updates is to inform policymakers, stakeholders and the public and stimulate countries around the world. This particular edition of the economic update comes during a time of numerous shocks, emanating largely from the COVID pandemic, but now including rising commodity prices and logistic costs, thus threatening the pace of recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, uh, today's rates of GDP growth for 2024 fiscal year 2023 so that's from June um, uh, 2021 to 2022, June 2022, and also fiscal year 2024, which begins uh, July 1st and uh, goes until um, uh, June 2023. Uh, the GDP growth rates for these periods are almost half a percentage point lower than where the economy was envisaged to be six months ago when we released the 18th economic update. Government has embarked on a fiscal consolidation drive to rein in debt and create more space for responding to shocks. So this special theme of the 19th economic update is therefore how to deepen reforms in public investment management to support the government's fiscal consolidation agenda. For the past 10 years, the government has increasingly prioritized capital development as one of the tools for facilitating and stimulating economic development in line with the National Development Plan and also Vision 2040. The overarching goal of this strategy is to address the binding constraints on economic growth in the country and in particular the significant infrastructure deficit that the country faces. It is difficult to envisage how these investments would enable realization of the intended objective if projects are not managed efficiently and effectively. According to the 2015 IMF estimates, a country performing at an average level uh, obtains 30% less output in terms of physical infrastructure for a given expenditure than a higher performing country. Up to two-thirds of this efficiency gap could be clawed back through improved public investment management. 
and especially the efficiency of these institutions, so closing that efficiency gap in capacity of the institutions. So cognizant of the benefits of this uh, need to close the efficiency gap, Uganda has already embarked on a series of reforms to strengthen its public investment management. These reforms over the past five years focused on improving the quality of projects at entry. Hence, a dedicated department in Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development was established in 2015 to spearhead the PIM reforms, public investment management is what we call PIM, and in particular to develop and promote the use of standardized guidelines and user manuals for project preparation and appraisal. In addition, national parameters and economic conversion factors to support project uh, um, uh, program appraisal rather, as well as the selection criteria for projects were added to the public investment pro, uh, 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 program. In other words, the selection, selection criteria for projects that are added to the public investment program. These have been developed, both the conversion factors and the selection criteria have been developed to ensure that the same approach and processes are applied across government agencies when preparing programs and projects. The impact of these reforms is already visible in the improved quality of projects submitted by ministries, departments and agencies to the development committee at the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. The independent reviewer and the gatekeeper for approval and admission into the PIP. So this role as uh, independent reviewer and gatekeeper that MOFPED plays is, uh, has significantly improved and in effect the percentage of projects that are underpinned by a cost-benefit analysis out of the total entering the PIP while still low has improved from 10% uh, in 2015 to 37% in fiscal year 2021 as reported by the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. So while the impacts of some of these reforms may be realized in the future, in the future they signal, signal that investments are, will, uh, are and will increasingly be better managed. Nonetheless, the progress around the administrative processes is being discounted by challenges in critical areas, including project prioritization and selection, budgeting and implementation. Therefore, there are still numerous cases of low execution rates on development partner and own budget projects, lengthy approval processes, lengthy implementation delays, cost and time overruns on projects, and high commitment fees in, case, uh, uh, in cases of some of the externally funded projects, especially those financed through commercial uh, or non-concessional loans. A shortened lifespan of these project investments due to poor operation and uh, maintenance of these uh, assets and low capacity of some of the MDAs and continued non-compliance of many projects to the guidelines. So still a raft of uh, uh, areas for improvement. For example, according to the Auditor General's report in fiscal year 21, out of a sample of 371 projects in the public investment program, 245 projects, which is about 66%, with project values of uh, 643 trillion Uganda shillings or 173 billion US dollars did not have feasibility studies undertaken before they were allocated financing. These persistent challenges underscore the complexity of reforming public investment management frameworks given the many institutions, processes and mandates that must work together to form a system that is able to manage investments efficiently. For further gains, reforms need to be deepened around project prioritization and selection, budgeting and implementation so that we can go beyond the administrative processes of the pre-investment phase of PIM. First, the gatekeeping function can be strengthened 
by introducing a legally binding seal of quality at the end of the appraisal stage to signify readiness of project proposals for financing. Second, budgeting for projects must improve. The allocation of resources for projects must use the project life cycle approach and provide adequate resources for project preparation and close the gaps in budgeting for operation and maintenance costs in order to protect the assets that have been put in place. To promote the culture of investment maintenance, each project must have at its appraisal the ex-ante appraisal forecasts of both the project's capital expenditure and operational expenditure. And finally, Uganda must improve the implementation phase by building project implementation capacities, while at the same time strengthening and streamlining the monitoring and evaluation functions of the PIM system. So implementation is critical to get the projects uh, on the ground, uh, on time, and of a quality that can sustain over time. Let me end here by thanking you again for coming to this 19th edition of the Uganda Economic Update. The tool, the update, will be a useful input and stimulate productive debate about the country's development. And therefore, we look forward to a fruitful and mind-tickling discussion today. And so I uh, hand over to the um, facilitator and thank you once again for coming to join us here in this room and online for this de uh, debate today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Mukami. That was uh, Mukami Kariuki, uh, the country manager, World Bank, Uganda. Uh, my name is Bernard Tabaire, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to this launch. Um, next to take us through this morning is Solomon Serwanja, uh, who I think most of us in the room know, but um, because of his work at NBS TV, at NTV, but he's now the executive director of the Africa Institute for Investigative Journalism. Uh, over to you, Solomon. Thank you, Bernard. We're super excited to be here, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Kami, for such um, mind tickling um, <laughs> opening remarks. Interesting to hear the Auditor General's report there highlighting about projects worth 643 trillion did not have feasibility studies and yet they were funded. Interesting. All right, welcome once again to the, nine, to the launch of the 19th Uganda Economic Update. Without any further ado, uh, I want to invite uh, Ms. Rachel Sevode, the Senior Economist at the World Bank, um, to give us her presentation on the state of Uganda's economy. Um, I must say that Rachel is not in perfect health, um, so uh, we will watch her presentation online. Um, and may I ask the people in the back end to please put it up. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Good to have you again on this 19th edition of the Uganda Economic Update. This time around, we are focusing on fiscal sustainability through deeper reforms to public investment management. You are most welcome. As is always the case, this edition also has two parts. The first part is talking about the economy and what have been the recent developments before moving into the outlook and how we expect the, 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 the country to look like in the next one or two years. Then the second part delves into the issue of public investment man management and how it can support the fiscal consolidation agenda that government has undertaken. In the first part, on the global side, we know that there has been a number of shocks that are derailing the global recovery. Growth that had reached 5.5% in 2021 is now estimated to slow down to about half of this value. And this is mainly because of the commodity prices. As you can see in this chart, 
growth, um, the commodity prices had been increasing since through uh, 2021. But then because of the Ukraine crisis, the, there has been a surge in the uh, commodity prices. And this is affecting ev almost everywhere across the world and, and economic activity. Um, the other impact has been through the supply chain disruptions and rising uh, transport costs, but also the resurgence of COVID in some areas like Asia, where you find that um, um, uh, COVID restrictions or mobility res restrictions were actually reinstituted when the COVID crisis hit. Some areas like the US have also been tightening monetary policy and financial policies and withdrawing their liquidity support, which has made global financial markets tighter and tighter, making it tough for those who wanted financing to support growth um, to, 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 to get it going. Furthermore, um, in the euro area, that has been most affected most recently by the Ukraine war because of its direct trade and financial migrant ties, financial and migrant ties, as well as the huge energy dependence on Russia that has been disrupted. Overall, the increased levels of uncertainty due to these factors are also add to the global, the, the geopolitical factors that have sometimes affected growth, um, but have not been captured in these factors. Overall, um, slow growth in manufacturing and trade is a major impact uh, across the world as commodity prices raged, and this has had implications. For Sub-Saharan sub Africa, the economy uh, grew at 4% uh, in 2021 as the pandemic went and countries also eased mobility uh, conditions. But the recovery is expected to be much slower than the rest of the world. This is mainly because of the fiscal tightening and also withdrawal of these support mechanisms that had helped economies start to recover. The risks abound. Um, COVID-19, given the low levels of vaccination, Ukraine war, and uh, sanctions that are affecting um, financial markets, especially, and trade. Coming back to how this is affecting Uganda, I wanted to talk about a little bit on the external developments. External developments, especially through the flows, through trade, through remittances, through travel and FDI. These flows had been improving and until December. There had been a very positive trend with respect to almost all the flows except exports. On the export side, what happened is that gold exports stalled on account of a levy and uh, this brought to a standstill what had become Uganda's main export earner. Coffee exports on the other hand have been growing strongly and increased due to uh, increase in domestic production as well as a positive price shock because as commodities prices are increasing also coffee exports have been increasing and we're almost uh, 1.7 by the end of the first half of the year. Gold slumped, but much as gold slumped, other non-coffee uh, exports were also improving and have, um, have passed what had been recorded in the uh, pre-COVID period. On the other hand, the travel that has been most sensitive to COVID has also remained subdued. First, the, the recovery that had been seen in, in the days running to the end of the year were brought down because of the second COVID crisis. So we see that um, travel inflows came down. We don't have the numbers for the second half of the year, but the expectation is that the COVID uh, resurgence in some areas in Asia, as well as the Ukraine crisis, could have also created further uncertainties about travel and brought these flows further down. On the domestic side, 
we start with a monetary and uh, fiscal poli uh, and, and financial policies that have been very supportive to, to growth um, until recently. Monetary policy remained supportive um, because it kept the interest rates low at 6.5% until it tightened it to 7.5% in June. In spite of that, private sector credit did not uh, grew at only 4.9% over the nine months to FY22. The CBR raised to 75 in June and uh, the, the liquidity support is also expiring. So those also, uh, those developments raise um, uh, risks about credit and how it's going to move uh, going forward. Credit recovery was strong for manufacturing, but slowed down for trade and business sector. But on the positive side is the fact that actually government has borrowed less from the banking system. So that can help hopefully support a recovery of the credit. But on the other hand, banks are more risk averse. For example, they approved only 56% of, 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 of the loan applications that were received in the second quarter of this financial year, compared to 70% that had been approved in the previous periods. So that shows how risk averse the banks have remained in this period and which where they are much needed to support the private sector to recover. On the side of the fiscal policy, government has embarked on a fiscal consolidation. Um, this could have been realized through revenue, but revenues have actually not performed as was expected. By the end of the second half, it was below, um, below target and is expected to have remained below target even by the end of the financial year by about 0.4% of GDP. On the expenditure side, expenditures declined due to some planned cuts, but also the under execution of the capital projects. So this is not good for growth because it means that what would have supported the private sector investments that are quite low in recovering is also the buffer is not there uh, through the public sector. Domestic areas were paid up to 60% and they increased by up to 60%, which is a positive development, but the supplementary budgets have also remained an, 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 a feature of the budget even during this financial year could have raised to about 8.5% of the budget. The deficit is expected to have reduced to 7.5% of GDP with a reduction in domestic financing, which is also positive for the private sector. Debt is estimated to have reached 529 which is some 0.9, almost a percentage point higher than what is uh, envisaged in the Charter of Fiscal Responsibility. What has this meant to the economy, to growth um, uh, at, at the end of the day? We see that, like was the case elsewhere, Uganda recovered strongly in the first half of the financial year 2020-2021, with growth reaching 7.9% of GDP. But this was before the second lockdown, because um, again, the economy was brought to its knees and uh, growth actually slowed down before starting to recover in the second uh, quarter of the year. Overall, this half of this financial year grew at 4.3%, which is much less than 7.9% that was realized in the previous financial year. Uganda's recovery has been moderately supported by the private sector investments, um, but at least they've been stayed positive since the opening of the economy. We see that the PMI, both the PMI and also the Bank of Uganda indicators um, suggest a very positive development over the first half of the year, with the PMI remaining above 50%, that means there was um, a growth for almost eight consecutive months. However, 
uncertainties related to Omicron uh, disruptions in the in the supply chains in key supply regions like China and the tightening of the financial markets are expected to have disrupted the recovery into the second half of the year. So for that matter, we expect that growth would have reached around 3.7% of GDP for the financial year, um, which is much lower than what had been anticipated. Households remain vulnerable to poverty in spite of the very uh, limited social protection systems in the country. For every shock that has hit the country, we see that there was always either a fall in employment or reduction in incomes for the households. One of the examples, the, the surveys that were taken between April and November 2021, between the two lockdown periods, uh, just before the second lockdown, and this, we see that there was a fall in employment of almost 11 percentage points. In addition, 50% of the households reported that their food insecurity had increased. And with weather conditions are actually adding insult to injury in this period. The recent rising food or the rising food and fuel prices are likely to have even more effects on, on households as they go through um, managing an increased cost of living, um, especially for those living in the urban areas. It is therefore important um, to develop the social protection systems. As we can see, the quite limited, as is shown on the right-hand side of, 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 of the slide, that shows the evolution of access to social protection through the different um, shock periods um, or the survey periods. It shows that the, in the last one, there was only 13% uh, access by households to any form of social protection. In terms of the outlook, we expect a recovery to continue, but to remain very fragile. Real GDP is expected to increase to 5.1% in financial year FY23, and this will be driven by some pickup in private consumption, much as this is going to be um, uh, discounted by the rising cost of living, the, by the rising prices. Secondly, there is um, the expected some increased recovery in exports because of the increased commodity prices for these exports that Uganda exports. But on the other hand, that is also discounted by the slowdown in the global economy as the shocks on the global economy increase. On the upside, the waning of the COVID-19 pandemic and the full reopening of the economy in January 2020, effective this year, as well as the clearer prospects for Uganda to start production uh, indicated by the signing of the final investment decision in 2022, had provided a strong optimism. This has been discounted by the new shocks, the commodity prices, um, especially through the Ukraine war, the tighter financial markets, the supply chain distortions, as well as the resultant increasing pressures on inflation that call for a more cautious monetary policy that had provided that support for private sector growth. FDI was recovering and uh, uh, could also be affected by these new developments in the financial uh, markets but also the concerns about environment, uh, international concerns for environment in the oil sector. Unfortunately, even with this outlook, per capita income will remain well below the NDP target, meaning that Uganda will now take longer to become a lower middle income country uh, than had been expected. There are also significant risks to the outlook. Significant risks remain on the evolution of the, of the COVID-19 and its effect on Uganda, especially given that 
the, the, the level of vaccination, which is currently about 24% of those who have been fully vaccinated. Secondly, there are weather shocks that are also uh, likely to impact, especially agriculture, which is a backbone of the country. Third, um, the global financial markets could tighten even further than what we have incorporated in the, in the, in the, in the baseline so that finances become harder to, 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 to receive. And then among the other global factors is the, the fact that the stimulus will, that will be provided by advanced economies and as well as trade and uh, tourism might actually not be as good as they would have been. So with those risks, the recovery remains fragile and they, hence they need to be managed. So what is critical for Uganda to have a more resilient and inclusive growth um, recovery? The priorities for a more inclusive and growth recovery um, include one, accelerating the vaccination effort, two, targeting interventions to support the vulnerable people while also accelerating building of a foundation for a shock responsive social protection system. Third is to make sure that fiscal policy and debt management are prudent to support the fiscal consolidation. Um, and, and, and this will require focusing on reducing domestic areas, reducing domestic financing, focusing on non-concessional financing, and uh, going ahead with the expenditure rationalization, and also identifying and managing risks such as those coming from SOEs and NSSF. The fourth is about monetary policy tightening, which is supposed to be balanced delicately with the need to make sure that we also support the recovery. And finally, it will be the issue of making sure that we accelerate the structural reforms that are necessary to raise revenues, are necessary to improve efficiency in public investment management, and, uh, so, and, and to rationalize expenditures so as to support a faster, sustainable, and inclusive growth agenda. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, Rachel, thank you very much. Rachel is a senior economist with the World Bank and she was the team leader on that. Rachel, thank you for giving us a holistic view of how we are doing. And um, interesting statistics that came up and I thought that we could take a deep dive into um, Rachel's presentation with uh, Professor Waswa Valunua, who is the principal at the Mackay University Business School. Thank you very much for joining us, Prof. Well, let's start off with, I mean, we, we, there are no questions because we are really struggling. And it's not only Uganda, it's globally. I was looking, I was watching um, a television show last night where Christian Langard, who is the president of the European Central Bank, and she was saying um, they're not even about to reduce inflation, not even any time now. And I thought that it's not only Uganda that is struggling, and globally there are so many other countries that are struggling. I, I just wanted to ask you, what is it that we did, you know, what is it that we did well, and what is it that we did not do right? And if we were to turn back the time, what could we have done differently? And what would be your general thoughts on the economic outlook? Professor, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much. A very good morning to all of you, friends, who are uh, in this session. Uh, I think to be able to understand the growth in Uganda, you need to look at it from the perspective of uh, what is the nature of this country. We've got about 70 to 80 percent of the people outside the economy. These are the people in the rural areas. And the 20% the of us who are normally affected by all this. I, I realized this during when COVID started. I have a farm somewhere in uh, the rural part of, uh, of Soga. And uh, 
people didn't understand what COVID was. Uh, so their economy was largely not affected. They continued to produce their maize, buy their maize. It's only when they went out of the shops that they started realizing, okay, there is, some, there is something happening. Now, we must take recognition of that fact in our policy formulation. How do we bring those people on board? And indeed, I think I remember writing a small article that for the first time uh, um, in the country, the, the poor people will be the beneficiaries of what was taking place. Uh, that article must be somewhere on my, my, my blog. I need to look at it again. So what did we do right? I, I think, um, uh, yes, the government of Uganda went out to really protect Ugandans you know, in terms of uh, keep them away from COVID. And to a great extent, it was very successful. Because if you trace where COVID came from, it was through really people coming into the country. And uh, possibly, uh, we are yet to, to, to get research results on this, that uh, that, could be a, that could have been the reason why the COVID rate infections were that low. Um, uh, but what, what didn't we do well? The stimulus package came very late. I think if you go into, uh, and it, it, it went to the wrong places, you know, uh, government came and said, we are going to put money in UDB. How many projects does UDB handle annually? UDB is a long-term finance institution. It definitely cannot handle small business. I think subsequently the Minister of Investments came up and said, no, 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 we're going to change this and uh, but uh, up to now, if you make an assessment of the stimulus package, uh, definitely you will see that it didn't work. Uh, the largest affected people were the ordinary people in the markets. They came back to town because they, had, they could not stay at home. You know, th these were real things that uh, people came back to, to, to town because they had nothing to eat. They came back to do to to to. to to, to sell something small. So to me, uh, the, the government should have uh, a year into COVID started a stimulus package which should have uh, uh, gone to the right areas of production. production. And uh, 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 it used the wrong vehicle because it used uh, the UDB. I know that there's some money in the microfinance center. Uh, well, no, not much really came up in that respect. Two, there was no support for, for that 80% of people in terms of understanding the technological developments in the country. So uh, I should say the, 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 the stimulus package was deceptive. Uh, Yes, for the medium enterprises and large enterprises, they're doing very well, thank you. You know, I have a factory in my village in Iganga. They brought people in, the steel rolling factory. And they stayed in and they worked. And I'm sure it's made, it's made progress, like many others that did. And uh, those who, if they wanted money, they get it easily. Because the there's money in, in, the, in the banks. So uh, I think government, uh, besides not taking care of that 80 percent, not 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 finding a way in which to impact that 80 percent uh, of the population uh, in the stimulus, because if you did that and increase production, you would see different figures in the economy. Now, PDM, the parity development model. This is where government now is, is, is approaching the 80 percent. But the statistics tell us that uh, only 30% of Ugandans are entrepreneurs. This, this is a global thing. Uganda is highly entrepreneurial, you know, you know this. Uh, but only 30%. Now we are putting money into parishes, an equal amount of money, to do what? What is it supposed to do? If the government of Uganda had identified products to be produced in different parts of the country, you make products. Because what is produced in Kabale is not the same thing as in Karamoja. 
but we are putting money into this some kind of stimulus package and um, we're not training the people so we are addressing that 80 percent without probably the, the, the uh, as the, the, the manager said the feasibility studies in all public projects where is the feasibility study in the in the in, the, in this project a trillion shillings is going into the economy and you know with public uh, public projects possibly what will reach the people may be less than 50 percent i think the president has been has been hard saying most of this money should go to the actual beneficiaries not to administration and allowances and the, because this is where the money goes so the the, 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 the stimulus I, i'm seeing is in terms of the parish development model but uh, we, i wish we are targeting that 30 percent of the people who can start business uh, so they not they must be identified and i wish too that to, to me all we needed to do was give um, ensure that what is produced has a higher price in the 1980s i remember part of the coffee study that we did uh, when the president i was part of the committee that told him we should dismantle coffee marketing board and he was worried and at that time bank of uganda was paying farmers you may not know this Bank of Uganda would go to the villages to pay farmers, and it was not acceptable. How can the central bank go to pay coffee farmers? So he told him, look, all you need to do is give that coffee farmer a higher price and he'll produce, he'll respond. And indeed, it, it worked. The coffee production went up. Look at what has been happening to the cotton production in northern Uganda. The price has gone down and they've stopped producing. So what you need to do is, to me, Give the farmer a higher price. Train the farmer further more into what he or she is producing. And uh, guarantee them a higher price. You are going to see production in this country. Because what we need is production to be able to have that big 80% people included, gradually included into the economy. Yeah, interesting. As, as long as you provide the market, I think the market component is very interesting very very um, strong in there what i also pick from what you've just submitted is that focus was not put to the smaller medium enterprises but rather um to the big manufacturers and i remember that government put a lot of money in the uganda development bank whilst money was also put in the uganda development corporation and uh, the uganda microfinance support center all right um the hashtag for today's conversation is ug economic update um on twitter so if you're putting out any tweet please add that hashtag professor let's talk about the private sector credit this report has significantly mentioned that it was very it was not very supportive to the economic recovery largely because of what the report entails um you know government borrowed heavily from the domestic markets but also uh, the cbr that has now risen to about 7.5 and not to mention um, the Bank of Uganda credit relief measures which are expiring very soon. What is the likely Im impact or implication to this? Uh, uh, COVID-19 led to layoffs and closures and definitely the private sector was uh, cautious uh, on what, what do I need to do. So even private sector credit had to be cautious. I mean, why do you give money to people who are not, op not operating at high levels? In fact, just to cut you short, yeah. I looked at the, the figures that they said that the loan approval from commercial banks yes. stood at 56% compared to 70%. And uh, the report says because of the risks. Yes, yes that's true. That's true. I mean, uh, how, why should I give money to a company that is laying off people? Uh, of course, given the fact that there was a, a, a drop in production in various activities in the economy, uh, you definitely had to see that private sector credit had to hold. I mean, I, why should I give money? And by the way, there's a lot of money in, in, the, in the banks. Interestingly, you know, I, I don't know if there's somebody from Bank of Uganda here. There's a lot of money in the banks, but at that time, 
you couldn't simply give it out because you didn't know uh, whether the, this people would actually use it meaningfully or not. And uh, I believe right, right now, if we got figures in, this, this percentage would be increasing as the, as the economy kind of turns around. Though, of course, uh, the current shocks uh, from the Ukraine war and uh, the, the, the revival of, of COVID may again affect uh, 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 production in some areas. But um, to me, I think the credit position, who are you giving credit, by the way? You know, that's another point in, the, in this economy. Uh, there is need to develop entrepreneurial capacity. While Ugandans are highly entrepreneurial, the quality of the ideas and quality of business is very poor. Indeed, there's, there's tremendous entrepreneurial activity in this country. Go out everywhere in the country. You're going to see people doing lots of things, but they are too small or they're in the wrong business. Um, border border is huge industry. Unfortunately, it's not good for the economy. It's too expensive. You know? So, but, but it's there, it's giving an income to a million people, giving, giving livelihood to a million people, but it's a wrong business. You know? Why do you say it's a wrong business, Prof? <laughs> uh, what would it be, what does it take you in a bus to come from Nakawa to Kampala? What would it take you? How much would, it, would you pay? Ordinarily in a bus. Let's say in a 14-seater. I think from Nakawa to Kampala, maybe 1,000. 1,000. And mm. what, how much on a border border? About, about 2,000. 2,000 or yeah. 3. Yeah. It's high cost. If you're really doing good business, border border is high cost except for deliveries of uh, things which, where you've costed it. So what you need in this country is, uh, let me use the word public transport cautiously because public trans transport may mean government-owned buses. No, not necessarily. If you improve that Kaiwala, it brings in people. They wait because they can't afford the border border. What you need to do is improve, provide low-cost transport to people who are coming in to work in this country. And you would have crowded out all the youth who are being employed by the border border sector. Yes, yes, yes. There are over a million people on the border border. You need more trains. You, you need to reduce the cost of producing things in this country. And the border border definitely is very expensive. I, I know many people get live routes out of it, but uh, uh, it means we're not planning well. Uh, and look at it. You and me should see three, five years later on. Where does the border border go? I'm sure you are familiar with uh, Kira Motors and their plans for hoping that one day they will have this public transport approved. That will not happen either. Uh, uh, because of mistakes that we are making in the economy. We are failing to provide for roads as a country. We are failing to regulate uh, the, 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 the land allocation system, especially in urban areas. So we, 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 are, we are creating a very expensive economy. So the border border people, uh, you know, in business, there should be somebody to provide a service or a good, whatever it is, a good or service. It will always be provided by somebody who is low cost producer. That's my belief in the free markets. All right. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Um, if you just um, cast the spotlight into the future, how does Uganda's economy look like? What are the potential risks and what can we do better to help this economy recover fully? Well, Uganda is likely to be a huge slum. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> uh, I'm assisted here by Rachel, <laughs> that Toledo is. Uh, you're going to see a lot of migration in the urban areas into very disorganized uh, places where people stay. We, this must be addressed. If we don't address it, that's where we are going. Uh, you're going to see, you know, there is a, we yet have to do the study between uh, theft and wealth. 
uh, insecurity and wealth. You, you know, uh, I always tell the story. Uh, my, my first time to get employed somewhere, I, I, I stayed in somebody's boys' quarters. Then I went into a flat into Makerere. Then I went somewhere and there was a wall. Then at some stage I had some personal threats and I put cameras and I, I got policemen. I have since chased them away from the house. But uh, what does that mean? But you are trying to protect yourself from the poor. We must address the poor. This country must address that 80% of the people through uh, identifying those who can produce and supporting them, uh, giving um, a higher price to people who produce uh, uh, cotton, coffee. Uh, let them get a higher price. You won't produce more. Because it happened in the early parts, in the, in the early 1980s, as the country started on liberalization. I think the peak was in 1995. You, you look at the figures of growth there. That's the highest growth we attained then. It, it, because the prices were good. We need to address that uh, to be able to get the economy going. Um, we need to be able to find something to sell. If we don't have anything to sell out in the market, into the, into the, into the external markets, then we shall continue to see a depreciation in the currency. Um, very quickly, 1986, when the President Museven took over power, the exchange rate was 1,400 to the dollar. The unofficial was 6,000. I was part of the group that recommended the currency reform, including reducing the, removing the two zeros and the tax. Uh, you may not know that. And the, the exchange rate went back to one, sh one shilling, one dollar 60 shillings. F fast forward, it's today one dollar 3,600. Or 700. Put the two zeros and you'll understand what it means. Now, what does that mean? We have nothing to sell abroad. If we have nothing to sell abroad, we cannot develop as a country. We shall continue to have slums in our country. We must be able to develop capacity to sell things abroad. And there are two products which we're not looking at. I know the goal is there. The, the gold is going to give us revenues, we shall do a lot of things, public, sec public sector infrastructure uh, will be developed, but the ordinary person will continue to be poor. So what do we need to do? Can we find a formula for selling maize to our neighboring countries? Maize? Yes. This country can feed the region. But what happens? You look, go, go back, to, go to Kenya. Uh, Kenya is banning our exports of maize because somebody in the National Serious Board in Kenya is buying maize from Mexico. These are things that our president must talk with the president of Kenya to see that we are able to sell something to Kenya because this is Uganda is Kenya's largest market, you know. So we must have that trade relationship figured out. We can sell maize up to Zambia if we produce it well. But, on the other hand, maize landed here from the U.S. is cheaper than maize produced here. Why? Because the Europeans and Americans continue to give subsidies to their farmers and they don't allow us to do it. This must be negotiated. This is the only thing that we have. Um, cassava. Forget about what the President said. That was a joke. But cassava has real potential in this country. Cassava can stay down there for five years. You know? So, and it has numerous products that you can get out of, industrial mm -hmm. products. So we, 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 we don't have to try and compete with the developed countries. We have these products we can actually explore to be able to improve our our production, our competitive capacity, in a unique manner. And of course, we must also get into the regional markets and have meaningful trade relationship in the, in the, in the regional markets. At the moment, I don't know what happens. One time I met the then Vice President coming from a meeting in Nairobi. I had to say what, what it was, but 
Uh, I asked, asked him, Your Excellency, what, what was it happening? He said he came, we went for a meeting, and uh, unfortunately the, the, the technical people went late. So he was there, and he really, you know, I, I don't want the, the press to quote me on this, but uh, uh, he, he wasn't supported by the technical people. So if you're not in the meeting where you're supposed to negotiate trade relationships, you can't have good relationship. And Kenya is very good. Kenya, Kenya is very good at uh, you know, tra negotiating what they want in the markets. We are not. So if we are going to, to, to really, this, the future of this country lies in our ability to increase our production of what we do, for that 80% of the people to get them out of that poverty, and increasing their productivity, their productivity in terms of the input-output relationship. If I'm producing maize, how can I produce it low cost and get the maximum out of it? And there are many mistakes coming up in the markets out there with the, the, the genetically modified uh, seeds. We have a problem in, in, in the countryside. Thank you. Um, you bring to my attention that we need to increase on our production for maize yes. and uh, look at it as a cash cow. Interesting thoughts. And uh, to some extent, I agree. Let's talk about the commodity shocks. Yes. It's quite becoming increasingly difficult to live in this country, I should add. I'll give you a short story. We have two cars at home, one of which is a big engine, the other a small one. So every day I take on the small engine. The last two weeks, my wife has always been running to the small engine. So I've been asking her, but you've been driving the big engine. Why are you now coming to my, like I can't afford the, the fuel anymore. I would rather pack it and I use the engine. The cost of fuel right now, I last checked, I think it was about 6,010 shillings and sometimes it's even higher. Commodity shocks, commodity prices are increasingly getting out of hand. What do you think should be government's response to the soaring commodity prices? I, I think one is to curb uh, the unauthorized export of oil, petroleum, the smuggling. Because the prices, the, the, the price rises, uh, part of them are genuine, part of them are artificial, arising from smuggling. Uh, I'm not a government, op government officer, but uh, I've met businessmen, leading businessmen in this country, who have said the problem with the fuel is smuggling. Have we, I, I don't know, but um, I know that smuggling can cause price rises in a country. So uh, our borders safe uh, on Congolese border and, uh, and the Sudanese border. Uh, they safe. Um, definitely prices are going up. Uh, I mean, what you say is, you even see it, this day that the jam was reduced. Uh, I, I normally, I stay in Bugorovi. Uh, it takes about 10 minutes to get here. But today I planned an hour ahead. Fortunately, the, the vehicles were not as many. Uh, otherwise, you can take an hour or even two hours to move from town to Golovi because of the too many vehicles. But what you're saying is right. To me, the government needs to look at that element of smuggling. The, the price rise definitely will, will take place. Uh, but on the other hand, where is the inflation coming from? Where is it coming from? For, for the price, the, the, the fuel inflation, where is it coming from? It's coming from Europe, not so. Europe doesn't produce oil. Have you thought about that? Is China having a, a fuel inflation? I don't think so. You know? Um, well, we are part of a global system. We are locked in. Uh, we can't get out. So the fuel prices increase uh, definitely if, if the, the world 
the geopolitics changes, we shouldn't see this. Uh, I believe that Asia is not, does not have high fuel prices because they are buying the fuel from the Middle East and from Russia. It is Europe that is having a problem in North America. So we have got export of fuel prices increases from Europe. Uh, can we avoid that? I don't know. That's for government to decide. The other one is in commodities. What is the other commodity whose price is going up? Uganda's food is largely grown in this country. So we should not have, uh, and you know, our inflation always comes from food, food scarcity. Whenever we have uh, a, a, a drought or we don't produce enough, we normally have inflation going up. And, and, and I know the central bank has dealt very well with that. Uh, so going back to my proposal, you must sustain increased production in what we, do, in what we produce. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, if you look at it closely, why should, our food, why should we have increase in food prices? It's because the transport is increasing. Otherwise, on its own, our prices should not have gone up. You know? So, um, uh, commodity prices, well, uh, that's a, it's, it's a headache for the, for the policy makers, but I, I think it's definite if you see where the source of the inflation is coming from, is something you can deal with. Mm -hmm. But now, unfortunately, we are leaving the central bank to, to handle, and you know, they, they must find a way of solving this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wasavalunya. A round of applause to him. <laughs> Professor Wasavalunya is the principal at the Macquarie University Business School. Thank you so much for breaking this for uh, breaking this down for us. All right. Um, without any further ado, I would love us to invite Rachel once again. Rachel has another presentation on the fiscal sustainability through deeper reforms to the public investment management. So I would love the back team to please uh, put up Rachel's. Greetings once again. We are back with part two of the Uganda Economic Update 19th edition. Part two is focusing on creating space for fiscal consolidation through better public investment management. Um, let's first talk about what are the factors that can help government to do a fiscal consolidation. The first one is about raising revenues. And that's why in the first part we mentioned it is critical to sustain structural reforms that are going to support revenue mobilization through, for example, implementation of the domestic revenue mobilization strategy. The second one is about cutting or rationalizing expenditures. This may not be so easy given that Uganda's budget is quite rigid. That means it has taken on practices that has sort of become entrenched in it and uh, it may not be able to easily adjust it. Looking at the chart on the left-hand side, you can see Uganda's budget compared to other, um, uh, other countries. And it shows that at 56% of non-discretionary spending, this is quite high uh, share of, of the budget that makes it difficult to adjust. So the third factor is improving efficiency. That means doing things better and making sure that for every shilling that you put in the budget, you actually get much more than what you used to before. Then the fourth is raising the base, mean making sure that GDP is growing. The issue of public investment management actually touches both the issue of improving efficiency in the budget so that you can get space for spending more but also making sure that these investments actually generate growth. So that's, that is why it is important to focus on this as one of the ways that can support government in uh, achieving its fiscal consolidation agenda. The interesting or very helpful um, development is that important reforms have already been undertaken by government to improve public investment management. There is a dedicated department in the Ministry of Finance that 
was established to spearhead this agenda. What the, the department has done, or what government has done, is actually to streamline the project preparation process and uh, making sure that there are standard guidelines and user manuals and uh, you know, guidelines for preparing and, and appraising projects. There are national parameters to, to aid in the project and program appraisal, as well as criteria for selecting projects into the public investment plan. A gatekeeper role is also established and growing in strength, and that is in the development committee, which is an interministerial agency that has the responsibility to review all the project proposals before they enter the budget. Thirdly, capacity building has started, starting with the Minto Finance, that unit in particular, but all the several other personnel, as well as within the MDAs, selected MDAs have been trained in core project preparation and appraisal skills. The benefits are starting to emerge as evidenced by the reports of the quality of project proposals that are submitted to the DC and the share of those that have been underpinned by the CBA, which is rising, although it is still low. And the fact that some bad projects have actually been um, debarred or not allowed to enter the budget for financing. So those are very positive developments. On the other hand, much as there has been this progress, a number of challenges remain. And you hear every now and then when we're talking about the budget, it's about, you know, the under execution, the, the bulk of the projects, um, um, you know, low execution rates, especially for externally funded projects, the cost and time overruns, the high commitment fees for externally funded projects, the shortened life of, of assets because they are not well maintained. And the fact that probably the bulk of the projects are still not following the guidelines. According to the Auditor General's report, out of a sample of 371 projects in the PIP, 245 or 66% with a total value of 643 trillion did not have feasibility studies, and yet they are in the budget. So that means much as the guidelines and the, you know, the processes are there, some projects are not actually following these guidelines. So overall, improvements have been made ab uh, around the administrative processes of the pre-investment phase of PIM, but these are being discounted in critical areas, including project prioritization and selection, budgeting and implementation. The reforms that have been undertaken had three critical success factors, yet these have not yet been um, completed. The first was to have a stronger legal framework. I know there is a PIM policy that is being processed, but until this is taken to the finality of strengthening the legal framework, then the reforms that have been undertaken so far will remain administrative actions that can be reversed or ignored without consequence. Secondly, the reforms also hinged on improving capacity across government. This has started, but it's work in progress. And the PIM Center of Excellence at Macquarie University must be nurtured to maturity to achieve this, this goal. So you find that many officers within um, different entities are still lacking those skills that are needed to either prepare or appraise or even to understand the feasibility studies that have been done by external agencies. Then third was the resources for project preparation. The project preparation fund had been set up, but it needs a clear governance framework for it to be a sustainable source of financing for project preparation and making sure that projects are ready for financing when they go into the budget. A reassessment of the PIM system suggests gaps on the entire cycle. As you may understand, the entire cycle starts from all the way from the concept, the idea of getting a project idea or concept, conceptualizing it, all the way through its development 
financing it, implementing it, until when it's an asset and it's uh, managed as an asset. And that is how you can actually get the highest return on your investment if you pay attention to the all the entire all the entire um, uh, cycle of public investment management. I won't go into the details of the outcome, but in terms of the highlights, I wanted to mention a few points. Carrying on with an ineffective and inefficient PIM system ultimately means that the growth and development payoff from these projects that are being invested in will remain very low and in the long run will not be helping growth. In the short to medium term where government is trying to do a fiscal adjustment, the adjustment will also not be made easy because you are not getting the efficiencies that you are supposed to be getting out of the budget to support the fiscal consolidation. Secondly, the most obvious problem for a budget process is the overhang of projects not moving to implementation, staying in the PIP for longer than the normal time, and uh, all those remedial costs that have to be incorporated into the budget to make sure that these projects are, uh, are implemented. So that is a cost that government has to, 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 to take into account. Then finally, it's the risks um, that, that may come up with a, a stop-go cycle in investments, which will make volatility worse, especially when the oil revenues come on the stream. So what are the priorities going forward? Among the many, you will see them listed in the report, the many you know, challenges stage by stage of the eight stages. But in summary, this is what we are saying. Going forward, the priorities for a stronger PIM system include, first is the issue of strengthening the gatekeeping function to ensure that all projects that are funded meet all the criteria that have been set, including undertaking the feasibility study. A legally binding seal of quality could be introduced at the end of the appraisal process to signify or signal readiness to anyone who wants to touch such a project for financing. Secondly, improving budgeting for projects is critical. Allocation of resources for budgets must use the project life cycle approach and also close the gaps in budgeting for operational and maintenance costs. Thirdly, is strengthening implementation. As they say, this seems to be the Ashley's hill in implementation or in, in, in managing public investments in Uganda. This requires building project implementation capacities, including procurement and contract, contract management skills, while at the same time strengthening and streamlining the monitoring and evaluation, evaluation functions of the PIM system. With those other areas of, of importance along the PIM cycle can also be closed and will then be running to a very efficient and effective PIM program. Thank you very much. Rachel, again, you're receiving all these applauses, but <laughs> we've not had you here. But we will get an opportunity to bring you in. Um, interesting things coming uh, through that I noted here. Um, again, it was also in uh, Mkami's uh, presentation. How can we even fund a project without feasibility studies? Interesting. But let's bring in Margaret Kakande, who is the head of Budget Monitoring Unit at the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. Clearly, public investment management and the need to reform it is very important, and I'm sure you agree. I've had very um, interesting uh, remarks um, in Rachel's presentation there that there's now a fully-fledged department at the Ministry of, of, of Finance. I think it's headed by Huntington Ashaba. And um, I know that you have since also collaborated with Makere University. 
to start up the public investments management course um, that Rachel says should be supported. But uh, let, let me come to you. What is going well um, at the Ministry of Finance in terms of public investment management and what could we do better? Margaret. I thank, thank you so much, um, Solomon. Morning, members. Thank you, Rachel, for, for the presentation. Uh, in terms of um, the PIMS and what is going right, I think Rachel did mention the fact that um, we've had some reforms in terms of having a department. Uh, we have the guidelines, we have the manuals, uh, we have a, a functional development committee which screens the projects. That is good because actually that is the foundation in terms of uh, having a good starting point in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, people can actually look at their projects before they get into the public investment plan, which is the PIP, uh, instead of having projects in, in, the, in the plan without all what has been shocking you, Solomon, without feasibility studies. So that is, that is going right. But um, I think even with that, like she said, we, we have some gaps that we can plug, yes. We can, we can continue looking at issues of uh, skilling. Um, but to me, there are some fundamental things that uh, maybe we, sh we are overlooking. The first one is the fact that um, if you look at um, the, the, whole, the whole process of um, identification of projects and having them put into the PIP, I think our biggest undoing is the fact that we have a lot of political interference, if I can say so. And so the, the fact that even with um, gatekeeping function at the ministry, we still have projects which come into the PIP without going through the due process. So, which means that even the, the, the recommendations of saying people should be skilled, yes, people now have the, at least the basics in terms of, of skilling, in terms of analysis, but if you have another level where a project can actually bypass the whole process, then it undermines the whole essence of argument for skilling. So you don't have to say people should be skilled in terms of uh, looking at projects because they are going to come in anyway without going through the process. So we have that, that, that problem. And I think also if you look at the, the, the recommendation that, um, which are related to that saying that um, at that point in time we should have a, a legal seal as um, a mechanism for ensuring that uh, before you have that legal seal, you can't go into the PIP. Again, to me, I would, I would ask, who is going to be the enforcer? Who is going to control this legal seal? Are we saying that uh, if we have the legal seal, then we have 100% guarantee that there would not be projects going over? Because we could have the legal seal, but then the question is, who is bringing in those projects which don't go through the process? Because if they have enough powers to have projects going to the PIP, they have enough powers to get the seal without due process. So I don't know whether having a legal seal is the answer to us having projects going through the, the system. And I don't blame politicians, by the way, for having some of these uh, projects coming through the, the window. I think unlike technocrats who always say, you know, for them they are permanent and pensionable? Politicians are not. Politicians have a lifespan, three, five years, and they have to be seen to deliver to their constituencies. So you have to have a balance. For them, they're looking at these technocrats who have a lifetime of doing things, who don't to, seem to be having this urgency of doing things, and for them, they want to show that they're doing something. And I think the problem that we have, which I haven't seen in any of the recommendations, uh, is the fact that much as we're talking about having um, an integrated bank of projects, I think, w which actually is, is starting, but it's very slow. That is the undoing. Because even me, I don't know when the road in my constituency will be done. All of us want roads, by the way. So there's nothing like saying that if X brings in their road because they, they don't go through that, the, the process is wrong. Because all of us need access in terms of, 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 um, of transport. But the fact that all of us are in the dark, we don't have a framework which shows which infrastructure will be developed when, you know, publicly. 
Because if we did and everybody knew in this constituency, in this year X, we are going to work on these roads, then in the other years we are going to work on these roads, then everybody will say, okay, now for these years we are looking at these roads, let's make sure that these roads are done as we also wait for hours. We don't have that. So we have this black box where we don't know what is supposed to happen, which roads are supposed to be worked on and when. And even if I was a politician, I mean, I would take advantage of that. And I would say, okay, I want my road done. And you actually push it in because there is really nothing to, 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 to as a, a basis for you to argue that you can't work on my road. So to me, that is a, a big gap that we actually don't have a plan, a comprehensive plan showing when all, for example, all roads in this country will be worked on because all of us need roads. We don't have that. So, of course, they take advantage of that. And even if we do all these things, I don't see these politicians sitting back and, and waiting for, for us to have all these things, skilling, the seals and whatever. Whenever they have a chance, they're pushing their things. So I think we also have to actually put our act together in terms of having that kind of transparency and comprehensiveness in terms of um, listing our projects. Okay. Can you stand up to this as, 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 as the ministry and say no? That it should be done this way. I don't know. And guard against political interference. I don't know. Because you, you must also understand, Solomon, that all of us mm. are answerable to politicians. So when you, when, for example, if you are in a, in a ministry, your political head is your boss. So a technocrat can't say no to a politician. And mark you, when we vote our governments into power, what are we voting? we are voting for their manifestos. <coughs> and it means that we must support them to implement their ideas. So in this case, if we're not doing a bit as technocrats to actually show that this is the plan and the kind of things we need to do, and for them they want to do things, then somehow it comes back to us. And it's very difficult, by the way, to oppose your boss. It's very, it's very difficult. And that is a, a problem for, for most of the of people because you know most of us have to save our jobs so it's, it's very difficult. <laughs> Having said that, I think also another, another problem that we have at this point in terms of um, the gatekeeping function, we have a DC, very functional, it's doing its, its job. But I think we also still have a gap in terms of uh, prioritization of projects. If you asked me, for example, that if you go into the PIP today and you look at all the hundreds of projects, and in light of uh, what Rachel mentioned, that we, we are actually going to suffer more deficits in the budget, we have budget cuts. So of course the rationally the, the question would be, out of all those projects, which are the most critical projects for funding? We don't have that, that information. We just have this big book listing all the projects, but we haven't done the analysis in terms of uh, ranking. If somebody said that out of the hundreds of projects, which are the top 10 projects that are going to make largest contribution, for example, to GDP? Uh, which are those most critical projects if we suffer budget cut? That should actually keep money because they are going to be critical in terms of stimulating growth. Which are those projects are going to have a, um, a knock-on effect, for example, on consumption? We don't have that. So what does it mean? It means that when you have these so many projects and you have a budget cut, as we've been having, or budget suppression, then it means that we just have this little money spread to everybody. And then we come to what Rachel was saying, that you, we, we didn't see a lot of um, delivery in terms of projects. Why? Because of the little money everybody was getting. In the end, money was inadequate for everybody because we had a suppression of the budget. But if we had a mechanism of actually knowing that at least let's suppress everybody else, even if they get zero, and say that out of all this, let's just focus on these 15. These are going to be critical in terms of rebouncing or regenerating growth because they have these effects on, on consumption, they are going to generate income or, or employment and so on. Then we actually say, okay, let's put our money here because it will make a whole lot of difference. We don't have that. We don't have that. So in that case, uh, you have this little, little money that we still have. By the way, we don't have, actually we don't have enough money for all those projects. So we spread thin. And once you have this problem of spreading thin, you really can't have an impact in terms of 
infrastructure development. So that's a that's a, that's a, pro, a, a, a problem. Even if you, you you are doing a lot of good analysis in terms of entry for 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 projects into the PIP, if you can't have that listing, whereby people can use when you have issues of budgeting or when you have issues of budget allocation when you have a, a deficit then you haven't really done enough in terms of informing that process all right Margaret, thanks for kindly of please maybe you can switch off that mic as well okay great thanks for being kind enough to really pour your heart out on this um <laughs> I hope you don't lose your job. I'll try to protect you with everything that I can. Um, but uh, let's talk about what strategies do you think we can adopt to ensure that we have value for money in every public investment? There's something I've been um, now that you talk about value for money. Something that are two things which I haven't actually talked about uh, in my presentation, we were, where we, we have issues. The first one is um, we have corruption. This is a national problem. It's not a, a problem of government people. I think Uganda is a corrupt state. <laughs> Honestly, people in the private sector are corrupt. People in civil, serv civil service organizations, I mean uh, NGOs are corrupt. People in government are corrupt. So it's all of us. We have this problem. It has become a national issue. And if we don't deal with corruption, I can assure you we shall never have value for money for whatever we are doing. And I think that's why you have this PIP which is clogged with projects. Projects don't move out of the PIP. We have other projects extending the lifespan of the projects because you give money to a company, people eat half the money, and then you are left with half. So if you are left with half the money, how much can this company do in terms of giving you a, 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 a good? Huh? And then it comes to the, the recommendation that um, Rachel is making that you see if you're budgeting for uh, infrastructure, for example, you should be holistic, you, you do it at the, for the whole life cycle, and you include um, operation and maintenance, that will, could be an, as well an academic exercise because I could look at a road and say, okay, Northern Bypass is going to be this, uh, this is going to be the O&M budget, but because of corruption, you find that we have a lot of Poor quality infrastructure. That's what we know. Now, when you have poor quality infrastructure, it's very difficult to budget properly for O&M. So, and I've been saying that um, people say, you see, you didn't budget for O&M for a road. But if this is a new road, eh, you've put up a new road, when should I really meaningfully put a big budget for O&M for a new road? Should it be after one year? Really? Honestly? So you find that because of corruption, we are doing substandard work, and then we have to sit back now and cry for O and M, because the road is poor quality. So after one year, the road deteriorates. How can a tarmac road of one year require a big budget for O and M? Honestly, so I think we have to deal with corruption. You and me. This is not a, a government issue. This is something all of us have to fight, because I think all of us have lost it. Because people think that if you are a thief, you are the, the celeb. Yeah, if you are a thief, you are the celeb. Because I think we've become so materialistic and you have all these things, people think you are, really, you are, you are the guy to take, which is not a government thing only, it's the whole society. So we have to deal with this. Uh, if you look at uh, a neighbor, Tanzania, one thing this guy dealt with, why he had a transformation for five years, was corruption. And if you look at the proportion of his capital development in terms of GDP, it was actually far much lower than Uganda for the five years. And if you look at the transformation that they had in infra infrastructure compared to what we have, it's laughable. And the only thing that was a big difference was because corruption was handled squarely in that country. That is your challenge. I'm leaving it to all of you. Handle corruption. Yeah. Then two... <laughs> <laughs> in terms of infrastructure, something we, we, we are also dealing with, which we, we always have a lot of debates in terms of are we doing the right thing? How can we do it differently? The issue of unit costs. Honestly, this country, you, you get a road, and the cost of doing that road compared to some other roads 
which have the same situations is 10 times. How do you justify that? So one time actually we made so much noise you, to you people in the bank. We said you people, we don't agree with the unit costs you are quoting for tarmac roads. And people are saying, ah, you see, because for me, I've never been convinced that a kilometer of a tarmac road costs a million dollars. Yeah, that is the cost. 300,000 dollars. Hmm? Then you say, oh, yeah. why is it so expensive? What is it that is in this tarmac road? So the, 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 the unit costs, we've actually failed to come into grips and to agree among ourselves as to what are the unit costs that we must use. So I think donors, say the bank, help us if we can actually get to grips and get the right unit costs on some of the things. Of course, it changes somehow on corruption. Because we all know that people are inflating the unit costs of things. But if we have something which is legal and say the cost of this scientifically is this, then maybe we could contain any, we could minimize, you know, the, the room where people could actually blow up the, 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 the costs. And I think for me, that problem of unit costs has actually made us not be able to do as much as we could do. We may not have a lot of money, but if we are actually honest to ourselves and just using the money we are supposed to use, we would be far much better in terms of what we've achieved in terms of infrastructure. So unit costs, we must really actually look at this issue of unit costs as we also look at issues of, of corruption. I was going to ask you the next is, um, <laughs> how should we implement these strategies? I think the bank has also been put on the spotlight um, to try to help Margaret's team to deal with the issue of unit costs. A round of applause to Margaret Kakande. <laughs> Margaret Kakande is the head of budget monitoring unit at the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. If you're tweeting, the hashtag is UG Economic Update and uh, it's your time to talk back. So if you have any questions, you may raise your hand. It's time for the media to ask a few questions. If you have any questions, you can raise your hand, introduce yourself, and get to ask my team questions. We're also happy to have Rachel. Rachel, I hope you, you have picked up a little bit to answer to some of the questions that may be raised. All right. Any questions from the team? OK. Um, do we have a mic? Okay, good. You're welcome, sir. Uh, I, I may do it sitting. My name is Hakim Wampamba. I work with NBS Television. Uh, key things to note in the in the entire update. Let us first speak on public investment management. We have some projects like Karuma, that I was told for years, uh, we, we are kind of requesting for an update and who is losing. Let us try to recount the cost that the country is uh, you know, losing. One, that will be for Madame Margaret Kakande. Uh, secondly, to Madame Mkame Karyoki, it is very important to note that uh, the country is headed for uncharted waters and uh, what we receive from the Ministry of Finance is not appealing to the local Ugandans because they seem to look at a government that is choosing to do nothing even when the regional uh, neighbors like Kenya yesterday they waived the taxes on maize. For us, we are being seen to do nothing. How sustainable is the government's stand, any of you, to handling the current surges in the prices? Many things. All right. We will take, I think, four or five questions. Then we can get my team to answer back. Yes, Michael. Um, I'm called Michael Baleke from CGTN. Um, Dr. Balunyo, I wanted to find out, um, you give a grim picture of what the outlook looks like, um, but would like you are the people, you are the economists, 
and uh, the people who think up, think for this country. What should Ugandans do in the absence of um, the government coming up with probably solutions to um, some of their problems? We know well, people are, we have the land. We have um, some people have the land. We know we know that. And interestingly, some are selling it to come and buy the border border. What should the people in the households do to help prepare themselves for the outlook, for this grim outlook? And then um, the, you've talked about subsidies. The government has a different view of subsidies. They actually said, uh, well, the government in Nairobi um, tried it on fuel but it hit them because the subsidies are targeting the wrong people. They are targeting cartels. What, um, do you agree that actually the government, sh sh um, you said, okay, this, uh, you, you prefer the subsidies, but the government says they will not be able to give uh, these subsidies. In what way, how can they bring them out so that these subsidies can target the real people that need to get them? And then they have also talked about, uh, the government has talked about um, oil and gas. Is this something we could look at? You've said gold may not benefit the local people, but do you think we can benefit from oil and gas? Thank you. Ten billion dollars to be pumped into the economy. Oil coming out of the ground by 2025. All right. More questions? Yes, you're welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alozias Kasoma. I work with the New Vision. I have a question that goes to the country director. Uh, recently, there was uh, public excitement uh, that Uganda has attained the middle income status. And then here, I'm reading uh, on in, the, uh, in the executive summary that uh, uh, below uh, pre-COVID-19 projections, uh, let me start from here, overall growth for financial year 2022 is estimated at 3.7% below pre-COVID-19 projections of over 6% and leaving Uganda's per capita income estimated at about uh, US dollars 850, while below lower middle income threshold of uh, US dollars 1,045 per person. I just want to get this into a clear perspective of where exactly are we uh, regarding the income status uh, I just want to understand that. Then secondly, uh, Uganda in uh, so many platforms has been discussed up as a country uh, destined for good, looking at where we stand, especially the discovery of oil and gas. Uh, we are number two after India when it comes to exporting organic stuff. I, I don't see you people mentioning about that. And when you look at the climatic activists, they say, how? Huh? Uh, fossil fuels should not be anywhere. Of course, they say uh, when you consider the value chain, oil and gas is is a, is a Uganda is destined for good. I just want to know to understand where are we? Thank you very much. All right. Yes. Thank you, uh, Elias Amchivi. Uh, mine goes to whoever it may concern. Reading the <laughs> the report. Uh, notes that now the CBR rises to 7.5% and I don't know whether as a common person I need to worry at all because it has been down to 6.5% for a number of months, maybe more than half a year, but also what we have seen, the interest rates have remained at around 20% if I go to borrow from the bank and the report also shows that banks have been more reluctant to give out loans even at uh, uh, even as the CBR remained low, uh, which means less people got uh, got loans, and then even those who got loans still got very high rates. And I th I, I, I don't think that just raising the the rates uh, the CBR by one percentage point would perhaps push the the rates at which I would access money uh, to a much higher one. So why should I get concerned? And why did uh, this, the low CBR not cause any significant changes for us? And uh, so basically that's what I want to understand. 
Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Can we first take those? Okay, please. Okay, thank you. I'm called Musings Branche, and um, I write for the Africa Report magazine. My r my question is re is related to the one from the New Vision report about achieving middle income status. There seems to be a big, perhaps, a difference in the way that the World Bank measures GDP per capita and how Uganda government measures it because as per government of Uganda we have already reached a thousand and forty six dollars World Bank puts it at eight hundred and twenty two the World Bank's figure is was last updated in 2020 but also when you look at how our GDP per capita has been growing in the past decade it has barely increased we reached around 2013 to 2016 when it was actually going down so even if the World Bank perhaps updates its figures, we may not reach that middle income threshold. Why is it that, first of all, why is it that government and the World Bank seem to view the, perhaps the variables that, that are used to measure GDP per capita differently? Second, it is that given that this econ our GDP per capita has barely increased in the in this past decade, what's wrong with our economy and what does government need to do that so that to achieve middle income status? Thank you. All right, thank you. I guess we may need to answer those, but there are also about three questions from people who are watching online. And I think I can read them out so that we can take it all at a go. Um, there is the first question goes to Professor Balunua. The parish development model has been initiated by government for the next financial year. We know that there are some gaps in it. What are the good things with the parish development model that citizens can leverage on? Your insight on this would be greatly appreciated, Professor. The second question again comes to you. Where should those who cannot reach the Uganda Development Bank do this situation? I don't know. I think this is not very clear. The information about how, where, and who should benefit from the fund. I think they're trying to ask if you cannot go to the Uganda Development Bank, where do you go to have access to these funds? And then there's a question from YouTube, and it goes to Margaret. Uh, Margaret has not advised us on how to start fighting corruption differently. In my own view and understanding, we, we are all corrupt and therefore we know how to solve the problem. Let Margaret advise us, please. Well, these are the questions that are coming through from online. Oh, there is another one. And um, someone is saying, it's called Ben Makanga, saying, thank you, Rachel, for the in-depth presentation. What could be the underlying factors that are underpinning the reduction in exports, and that's the percentage GDP, for the financial year 2013 uh, to the financial year 2014, and won't this decline and have a downside effect on the GDP growth, Ben Makanga? All right, let me now invite my panel to respond, and I think I should start with Rachel. You're welcome, Rachel. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and for those uh, very thoughtful questions. Um, I think I'll first, uh, I'll first go to the last one because we had responded on, on the chat on that question of what is driving the slowdown in exports for the next financial year. Next financial year, but one, that is 2023, 2024. Um, the focus we have actually shows a, uh, a flat. There is no growth in uh, next financial year that is starting tomorrow and then a, a reduction. And that is basically uh, drawing from what is happening to the global economy. If incomes are coming down, especially in Europe, which takes about 30% of our exports, we assume that that will have an impact on the exports uh, for Uganda. And that's the assumption that we use. Definitely that has uh, an impact on, on growth because exports are part of you know, the 
upward driving factor for for GDP growth, and that's why we brought down our forecast from um, to about six instead of what it had been earlier of 6.5 percent. Um, the other question that has been on the table, I think the one on Karuma is for Margaret. Uh, I, I think I, I can go straight to the middle income one. The middle income issue, um, I, I think, comes from the way the World Bank measures per capita income. The approach we use looks at because Uganda is an open economy so there are some residents within the country who are actually earning income out of Uganda and there are those who are outside who are you know who are, who are um, uh, earning income from Uganda so we take GDP and adjust it for that net income and that is one of the main differences between GDP per capita and what we call gross national income per capita. The reason the World Bank uses that is because of what I've said. Income is not just in the GDP, but also in um, those net flows between residents and, and the rest of the world. In the report, there is a box that actually <coughs> talks in more detail about how this is done in the World Bank, so you can get more comments there. The second uh, issue that we take into account is first of all the exchange rate over three years. The first, with the past three years, um, is um, taken the average because you don't want to take a one year's um, uh, exchange rate because of the volatility that you normally have. But in addition to that, is the adjustment for inflation between Uganda's inflation and that of of the world and for the world we take a basket of about i think there are seven countries the g7 that normally account for are in the basket of, of calculating the sdr rate but those are technical details that maybe you don't want to go but but, but, but the bottom line is that you take the movement in inflation versus the rest of the world so that you're not just looking at Uganda's situation because Uganda is situated in the rest of the world um, and for that matter. And the other issue is the population. We look at the media population so uh, and, and use that and, uh, as, as the basis for you know uh, uh, determining how much each person is getting. Uh, per, 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 per year and uh, <coughs> and uh, the, dat the data sources that we use are mainly the you know the, the, the Uganda Bureau of Statistics and while there is a lag the official number that is going to be used for classification of countries come 1st of July that is tomorrow is actually the GDP and uh, the flow, the GNI that was calculated for financial year 2021, because you don't have with certainty what has happened in, in this current year that is ending today. There are still estimates, you know, you're trying to determine the figures. So the number that is used with certainty is the one of what happened in financial year 2021. And then you do all the adjustments and come up with a, uh, you know, a firm figure and use that as the the gross national income for financial year to determine the, the classification for financial year 2022-23 then when it comes to the thresholds these are also adjusting if you also in the book if if you look at what has been happening you'll see that um, um, maybe page which page is this? Page 30. You see that the threshold also has to be adjusted. Way back in um, 1987, <laughs> the famous years, <laughs> 1986, the threshold was about 
200. So the threshold also has to be adjusted. The, this current year, we have 1,045. Then this maybe next financial year because it, it it is adjusted in line with what is going on in the in the rest of the world so next financial year it it is it it will be even higher most probably maybe in above five years it will it may even go to 2000 so it it is not static so that's what we should also take into account as our income is growing the threshold for getting into middle income is also uh, expanding so the bottom line is according to the calculations based on those factors the gdp G gni per capita uganda's um classification is is likely is is going to be uh, still low income in terms of uh, starting next financial year and that is because the calculated number is 840 you might wonder maybe if you go into details um, some of the factors uh, that could have made this lower than the GDP is the fact that as I said GNI uh, takes into account the net incomes between Uganda and the rest of the world in the earlier years this was a positive addition to GDP but in the most recent years it looks like there has been more outflows out, out of Uganda net income outflows uh, than inflows uh, in the in the most recent years. So when you compare this series, you will find that in the most recent years, GNI is actually lower than the GDP, uh, slightly. <coughs> but otherwise, they normally trend together. So I think that's what I can say on on the issue of middle income classification and why what our numbers are showing, um, given the methodology that we use. What does government need to do? To get to middle income level again i think uh, it is the issue of how do you make sure that the economy is transforming how do you accelerate growth all the issues that we've been talking about on how to get uh, growth going because as you've mentioned I, I don't know who mentioned the growth had slowed down because of these many shocks but how do we get back to to the uh, growth path that will enable us move much faster to middle income status I think those were the main questions. I, the SBR, maybe Professor will answer uh, uh, quickly as to why should we be even bothered if when it was 6.5 for so many years, so many months, nothing really happened to credit. Prof, you're welcome. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Michael, uh, I didn't paint a green picture, really, did I? <laughs> Sorry, there's a lot of activity in this country. If you, uh, as I said, many people are doing so many things trying to, you know, um, earn a living, and they do, and they succeed. But uh, my worry is about that 80% of the people I talked about, the poorer people. Uh, I think poverty is increasing, uh, definitely. So we need to address those. Uh, you, you mentioned it as you are writing here, I was saying they should stop selling land. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I wish somebody could tell Ugandans to stop selling their land uh, to buy borders or go to Dubai or things like that, but this is a problem of lack of education. What you need to do is put people in schools, educate people. There is no sort of shortcut to that. The other one is increased production. Let us increase production of what we do. but. Uh, as, uh, as Margaret said, uh, we will not be able to increase our productivity. She didn't say that, I'm saying it. Because of corruption. Corruption is an input-output relationship. If we are paying more money to do something, then it means we can never have a low-cost production. That's why business people in Uganda can't succeed. You know, so... Um, uh, we, we really have a very big problem. We need to increase our production and productivity. We may increase production, but we may never increase productivity as long as we don't solve the issues of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of corruption. You see, if a, a company sells products to government, if it sells air, that company may never compete internationally because it doesn't know how to do the business. 
Um, subsidies, I did say government should give subsidies. I don't believe in them myself, but um, uh, uh, I said the, the, the Western countries, Europe and America, give subsidies to agriculture, uh, but they tell us not to do it. And the World Bank here will tell us, don't give subsidies. You know, they, they, they will not allow us to do that. Uh, but the, the Western, the developed countries do. You know, so this is something that must come out of negotiations uh, with this bank, with these countries. Uh, all I said was, maybe it's a subsidy. Can we assure a higher price to the coffee farmer, maize farmer, cotton farmer? How do we do it? In the past, there were those uh, funds that were available. I, I don't know whether that's where we need to go because it's, it's a bit complicated. But assure the farmer a higher price, they are going to produce more. I think that's very important. Uh, shall our people benefit from oil and gas? I, I, I don't know. I, I can't say because I don't. I, I need to see this oil, this, this revenue is coming from this. When it comes. Uh, we'll see. It will depend on government policy. Where do they allocate the money? Uh, I was sharing with Rachel here many years back, the late Chayonka, who was chairman of Shell, I made some statements about oil, and uh, I still remember them. They are fresh in my mind. Uh, but uh, let, let's get this oil out of the ground. And uh, uh, as Margaret said, let the political agenda determine what, what happens. I hope that the active politicians can decide we need more educated people in this country. Uh, because this is one of our biggest problems. I'm sure most of you pay education, pay fees for many other people. Can we get the Ugandans educated if that oil comes? Uh, can we have that infrastructure? Possibly that's where, how it can benefit. But if you look at uh, Nigeria, the Dutch disease, you know, uh, it's always a problem that the oil goes into a few people's pockets. You know, there, there, there is, um, I was one time representing the governor of the central bank in a small meeting of uh, governors of central banks in Nigeria. And we had a visitor who came in to speak about um, uh, what was happening in the oil sector. In Nigeria, every building has a, a diesel generator. You know, every building has a diesel generator because there's somebody who imports and sells them up there. But that's a problem with the... Uh, there is no petrol... There's no petrol in petrol stations in Nigeria at certain times of the year. And yet they are the ninth producer, ninth largest producer of oil in the country, in the, in the world. These are challenges with the political systems. So I hope that uh, we'll be able to, to do this. Uh, Mr. Mchibi was wondering... Um, uh, if CBR was 6%, did we benefit? Uh, to me, CBR is effective for the 20% of the population. Uh, but on the other hand, if the bank rate is 20%, what is the difference? Ordinarily, the uh, CBR is a few percentage points above inflation. So inflation was 3%, CBR would be about 5 6%. And the commercial bank rate should be a few percentage points above that. Now, if for CBR is 6 and the commercial bank rate is 20%, what is the problem? Corruption, inefficiency. The banks cannot lend you money because you are too risky. So they can only lend you money at 20%. But indeed, some people... I'm, I don't think there's a company that can make a profit of 20% if it is doing the right business to be able to pay back interest rates and other things. So there's a challenge in the business sector in the country and these are things that we must address. So uh, the, the CBR is intended to, whenever it is increased, it is intended to slow down credit. So uh, as, as the central bank increases its, its uh, CBR now, is seeing inflation going up therefore if you if you put up the CBR it will reduce on the number of people borrowing now effectively in this country this affects a very small number of people uh, I mean the 
the Madivanis and the MTNs, when CBR increases, they'll say, let's not borrow. But not for you and me. Now, we have a problem in the economy. Government avails money through other institutions at um, 5%, 7%. This is a distortion of markets. Um, we, we must be clear about what we want. If we have said our policy is a free market economic, private sector led growth, let us allow the private sector to do its job. Let us allow the markets to determine interest rates. So when I am, uh, you give me credit at 5% and I start producing, then I don't want to pay taxes because we have not sensitized people about taxes. Now, the day you ask me to go to the central, to, to a commercial bank to borrow money, I will never borrow it because I can't afford it. I don't understand it. So we must, in the financial sector, sort out the distortions uh, of uh, uh, government low interest, low, low interest rates, then the commercial rates, then the, uh, you know, there's a, there's a big problem there. Um, Parish development model, it's, it's a wonderful proposal to address poverty. What I'm saying is that two things. One, in every area in the economy, government should point to what needs to be produced. What you're going to produce in, in uh, Guru is not the same as what you will produce in, in Masaka. So give the money to the people, but let, let's have... Uh, there was even that thinking that each area should have what it produces. Simply giving money to people does not mean that th that is a problem. I think the problem may not be money. It's a very good idea to mobilize people to produce, uh, but they need two things. One is where are you going to produce, and two is the training, the skills that people need to be able to actually produce. And of course solving the other problems of markets, roads, and so on and so forth. So the, 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 the model is good because it's going out to, uh, it's bringing a bit of um, um, socialism. I, I know you don't like this one very much as, <laughs> as, as, as World Bank. Yeah, no, no, I'm saying not she, not she has it in the video. But you know, whenever government comes out to give money, it's, 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 um, it's now distorting markets in a sense. Uh, it should find a better model. And to me, the better model is get people educated. The one million that enter into primary schools every year, and by the time they get to university, it's only 60,000. What happens to that number? Keep those, that number in school. Then you'll be driving towards a middle class, people who can demand things, people are exposed, people who can understand business. Um, otherwise, um, uh, what are these people going to produce? I, I mean, I'm not sure whether we've done, maybe that's a problem of uh, uh, not doing the feasibility studies sufficiently uh, before you roll out this money. You know, and uh, as Margaret said, at times these are political decisions. It looks a wonderful idea, but uh, is it informed? So I hope that those two things can be done mobilize people to produce certain things which are ideal for their area and also give them the necessary training. To me that the, the, the model will, will make some impact. Uh, where should those, where should they have gone who didn't go to UDB? Uh, that's the question he was asking because initially the money was in UDB, that's what was said, but small business people can't go to UDB. UDB has one branch. You know, uh, even these other banks with many branches cannot reach everybody. Uh, that's, that's why it's only mobile money that has been, has promoted inclusion. So where should they, where should they have gone? Uh, a, microfinance center has, has money for small businesses. Possibly that's one area, but I'm not sure about the structure of microfinance center, whether it goes out into rural areas. But two, Business people who have genuine business and need money, they know where to find it. That is how free markets work. You want money, you'll find it. Because you're doing a good business, your bankers are going to evaluate you and they'll give you money. 
So to me, uh, let the markets work. Um, uh, I think middle income status, these are just figures, people are poor, but the figure, <laughs> is, that's true. Because what, what the, the, the banks do, or what the World Bank and the government of Uganda does is, what is produced? You divide it with the population to get a per capita GDP. Now, who is producing? Uh, Coca-Cola produces, uh, MTN produces, and they're increasing production. The banks are, they are posting growth, you know, 12% uh, growth. Uh, I'm privileged to be a member of the board of MTN, and I must support you. I hope you all have MTN lines. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's very good. So, uh, uh, it is growing. It's growing, but uh, who are the beneficiaries? Uh, is it the ordinary people that will benefit from that? This is the shareholders. And thank God the other day they, they, asked, they, they rolled out shares to ordinary people. Uh, so that they too can start benefiting from this growth. So if uh, big companies like beer and soda and television are increasing in their growth, once you divide that on yourselves over the numbers of people, it will give you a very good figure. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that that ordinary person there has got an income. So uh, what we need to do is, can we focus on that production of that ordinary person? Finally, you don't need very complicated solutions, very simple solutions. How do we increase production in this country? To me, that, that's all. How do you increase production of the ordinary people and you'll be able to get uh, 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 the, 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 the growth uh, coming up very well? And if you go into a country like the U.S., I think uh, it's said 8% of the population owns 80% uh, of the wealth. So while they may have a high per capita GDP, very many people in the U.S. are poor because they don't actually take that benefit of it. So um, I think that's, uh, those are the issues that are addressed to me. How to f start fighting corruption. Um, I have a small book I'm writing on this. Maybe one day I'll publish it. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome, ma'am. Oh, Margaret, you want Margaret to go first? Margaret, you're welcome to answer some of your questions. Uh, thank you so much. I only have two questions. There was one on Karuma. I think Karuma, like um, other big investments, if we have delays in those kind of investments, I think it's us, the Ugandans, who lose out. So, for example, if you look at Karuma, that's um, a project worth $688 million investment. So, if that project could end, then we would have that fiscal space in the PIP. But when it's clogged with so much money, then others which would actually come in and get that kind of funding are not coming in. That's a big loss. But also the, the fact that if Karuma does not start working and we, and, and we get the power, you know the implications of not having energy you know, or in, in the different parts of the country. So it, really at the end of the day, we are, we are the, 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 the losers. Uh, corruption, uh, the person said that uh, we all know what it is and what to do. So please do what you are supposed to do. Um, I'll just say two things. I think we should make corruption a very expensive venture. Because right now, somebody can know so and so took a trillion. So what? Nothing really happens. But if there was a way, and I think there is a way, by the way, it should be through the, the, the uh, legal system, whereby you make it so expensive, you, you are must, you, you still may use the word, you, you, you take public resources, which you're not supposed to take, then we should be able to get your assets as a government or a country and get our money back. We make it expensive. Like that, actually, you even lose some of your assets, which are not part of the loot that you, you, you took. And that can be done. We can actually make it expensive. And on the part of all of us Ugandans as a country, I think we need some mindset change. Let's stop pampering people who are stealing our resources. You know, somebody goes and uh, amasses public funds, and then you vote them into parliament. Are we serious? I will stop there. Margaret Kakande, thank you. You're welcome, ma'am.
Okay, the good thing about being last is that most of the <laughs> questions have been answered. <laughs> So I'll just focus on a couple of things. There's a few that weren't addressed. I think the first one was about uh, what to do to um, address the crisis. I think there's a question about a do nothing approach during a crisis and what we propose should be done. So I wanted to say in that regard that we have been working with the government to try to come up with a, uh, some social protection space in terms of um, uh, an area where we can do more to try to target um, those who need help and make sure that they are supported. And I believe the cabinet already has a paper out on, or uh, approved rather, on social protection. And there are some efforts now to try to start to move in terms, uh, into the design of a program to reach those who really need the help the most. I think to an extent the PDM is uh, seen as uh, that type of a, an effort to protect those who are uh, requiring help and allow them to, to, to move forward. But um, I think uh, what we're really emphasizing, emphasizing is targeting and uh, also catalyzing, um, you know, in other words, to move people out of poverty uh, in terms of the social protection mechanisms. Um, I think increasing the rate of savings is difficult. That's also one of the efforts, but it's difficult during a crisis. So perhaps maybe more effort on collective action, you know, pooling resources as a community or as a group in order to allow things to, uh, to, to have scale and to move forward. And so I think you hear a lot about the SACOs being the focus. So I think this is a second uh, area. Um, a second point was about uh, the oil and gas. I think the point here is for us to keep our eye on the ball, which the professor said is the 80% that are not part of the, uh, the, the, the core economy now. And this will have to be the focus even with oil in the picture. You know, so it's really a matter of making sure that we keep uh, the diversification uh, of the economy at the forefront and we don't put all our eggs into the oil and gas basket, but rather we continue to try to move people out of subsistence into um, commercial agriculture for them to then, you know, really get the benefits of the, um, uh, the, the economic uh, uh, changes that are, are expected out of the oil production. Mm -hmm. Um, to what extent it could be a game changer, I think everyone has said we'll have to wait and see. Um, but I think uh, I would say it's maybe n not just waiting and seeing, but continuing to make sure that we don't lose the momentum on the agriculture, you know, as the driving um, force for this economy. Um, uh, I think the question of middle income status was answered, and I think that perhaps just, just to reinforce Rachel's point, which is that we have uh, global um, uh, factors to take into account, and therefore are more cautious to make sure that we are looking at this in the context of how else we have undertaken these estimates across the world. Uh, so the methodology is an important factor there, and Rachel has given uh, her explanation of the different variables that we put into place to look at um, uh, uh, middle income status. Um, the GDP per capita point, I think the point to be made here is that uh, if GDP is growing slower than, econo than population growth, we are not able to really generate the level of uh, impact that we need to make sure there are enough schools, uh, health clinics, and enough infrastructure and services to benefit the population. So that is a concern and something that we really have to look much harder into. And I think the professor's emphasis on productivity, really finding ways to be more productive in everything we do, whether it's agriculture or it's small and medium enterprise, um, you know, a focus on exports uh, is important. Um, so uh, we had recently did a country private sector diagnostic uh, which looked at uh, four areas which were seen as uh, three areas that were seen as important uh, drivers of the private sector. And that review uh, said that one of the key barriers to exports is standards. And so I think that perhaps is where we really need to place our focus. The issue in, re in regards to maize exports that was raised about Kenya had a lot to do with standards. And I think that the same would be said for 
uh, markets within the region and also outside the region that standardization of the products that are put on the market for export will be critical. Um, so I think uh, what we have to do there is for us to discuss uh, and see how we can then help government to move forward. Um, so I would like to just end with a couple of points that uh, our IDA, IDA 20 cycle, we have a three-year fund funding cycle for uh, uh, you know, development um, uh, economies that we consider to be part of the um, lower income group, uh, which receive uh, grants and credits, so out of the IDA window of the World Bank. And our IDA 20 cycle, which is just starting tomorrow, as Rachel said, for the next three years, we'll have funding that will go forward uh, to support uh, the countries that are considered to be uh, eligible for this uh, funding. Um, the emphasis of that IDA 20 cycle is going to be on human capital development, uh, given what we've seen going on in the world, that we've really lost ground in terms of education, not in Uganda, but across the world. And so really trying to make sure that we do everything we can to regain lost ground in the human capital space, whether it's education, health, water supply and sanitation, and the inputs that are required to get uh, people out of poverty. Um, and then we have a number of projects that we've been working on with the government to try to address a number of these uh, uh, issues. And I'd like to maybe just uh, say that there are two that have recently been approved by the bank, but are still uh, being approved through government systems that will help to address the small and medium enterprise issues that were mentioned. One is called INVITE, which is uh, investment in um, uh, industrial transformation for employment. Uh, that's the, the acronym INVITE. And that project focuses on really trying to go to the lowest, to, to the furthest uh, outreach or outpost in terms of uh, access to finance through um, banks and also microfinancing institutions to ensure that there is money that is affordable, that is of sufficient tenor, tenor uh, for the small and medium enterprises that require that money to come back into the fold. So it's about $200 million project which we are still hoping will uh, you know, come on stream as fast as possible to help with the economic recovery process. Uh, it's making its way through the processes, government processes now. The second one is called GROW, which is get generating growth through opportunities for women. And it is also targeting uh, women who comprise 70% of micro enterprises and trying to see how to get them to go to scale. So trainer. what is necessary I'm in terms of... Sorry? I'm the chief trainer on that one. Okay, he says he's the chief trainer, so hopefully he trains well. Uh, but the idea there is to really try to push this group over the bar into the small and medium enterprise uh, group so that they can then go to the banks and access finance uh, in, the no in the more normal uh, method. So again, you can see that we're trying to listen to what's going on on the ground in the country, in the region, and, and emphasize uh, the types of projects that can then fill the gap. Uh, it, a question was raised about uh, access uh, to um, uh, resources to enable the economy to uh, to continue to get back on track. So we are continuing to try to see how we can fill the gap, but also address um, the bottom 40, as we call it, of the population, uh, which uh, don't necessarily fit into the 20% the that he talked about and have access to alternatives. A last point is uh, the opportunity f to focus on regional exports has improved through the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement. And I think that uh, we, we are looking to see what can be done to really help government to take ad advantage of the opportunity that is opening up there. I believe recently we've heard about a big effort that's going on to try to see what can be done to export more goods from Uganda to fill in the gap that has been left by uh, Ukraine, for example, which was exporting maize to many African countries. If Uganda can fill in that gap, it would be a good opportunity. So I think uh, striking while the iron is hot is something that uh, perhaps we need to do in the forthcoming year 
not just to help with the country's exports, but also to address the question that was raised at the beginning, what should Ugandans do to prepare for the grim outlook, is really to see what can be done to really work together more collective, in a more collective manner to um, take advantage of these opportunities uh, for the country to get back on track. So I'll stop there and uh, turn it back to you. Wow, well, thank you very much. A round of applause to my panel today. Thank you for answering all the questions. Um, I think our time is fast spent. You had a burning one. Okay, I'll give you 30 seconds. Margaret, uh, I just wanted you to educate me on uh, how the, the absorption of the projects, I mean the money for the projects uh, is now, where is our absorption capacity standing, and then you slightly tell me how is the budget is really performing. And then uh, Mukami, today I will not ask you, Rachel or anything, but I'm going to ask Mukami something. <laughs> you just tell me about the budget support for maybe the next year. That's it. I'm coming to you take that. Okay, so budget support, we are not, we don't have budget support uh, outlined for the next year. We have uh, a number of projects which are planned for implementation this year. None of them are budget support, but uh, in terms of the um, the level of funding that would come from the government, from <coughs> from the World Bank, uh, towards these uh, projects, um, it will be determined, I think, largely by our discussions with the government, by the speed of implementation and also disbursement. But uh, we have uh, earmarked uh, as part of the what we call the performance-based allocation. It's between uh, 1.5 and 2 billion over the three-year period. It's all in form of projects, not budget support. Uh, so I think it will really det be determined by the types of projects that are critical for the economic recovery to take place and the project instruments that we use to finance uh, those projects. We have two typically, and that's uh, investment pro project financing and uh, project uh, performance for results. One flows through the budget to the recipient. So you've heard of um, USMID, I'm sure that's the one that's most well known, um, which passes money through the budget to local governments to do uh, the development of uh, priority infrastructure. Um, and the IPFs are uh, investments which go through the, largely through the private sector, um, such as the uh, electricity uh, projects that we've been financing. So it will depend very much on what government uh, prioritizes and uh, you know what we focus on. The first, so I can't really talk about the projects specifically until they are approved by government, but that's the envelope we're working within to try to make sure that we support government. But I think most critical point is that uh, implementation is critical to get the ongo the projects that we already have uh, supported with the. Um, uh, financing approved uh, through the um, uh, the final stages so that the impact can begin to be felt. Thank you. And I liked you boarded the word performance best. It just caught my eye. Thank you for that. Rachel, do you want to add something oh, to his uh, question? So, can I say yes. in a minute, uh, just to, to inform you that um, today is 30th, yeah, it's a very important date for us. We've closed the budget. So tomorrow we are beginning a new budget. So there's nothing like talking about uh, how is the budget doing. We are beginning a new budget tomorrow. Now, in terms of uh, absorption, uh, the only issues that we saw last financial year were mainly for externally funded projects. They had issues of absorbing funds from development partners. Uh, but those which were under GOU, government, I think most people actually used up their money. First of all, they didn't get enough because we had a 40% budget cut across the board. So in that case, the money was already reduced. 
so geo funding was already suppressed and people used what they had but for external funding a number of uh, projects had issues in terms of using those funds yeah could it have been because of performance performance based like Mukami said <laughs> all right thank you another round of applause to my panel <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Margaret Kakande. Uh, Margaret is the head of budget monitoring unit at the Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Professor Wasabalumia, who's the principal at uh, Macri University Business School. Rachel, of course. Um, Rachel is a senior economist with the World Bank. We've not had a lot of you, but hopefully we can have a lot of you later on as you pick up. And of course, uh, Mukami, thank you very much. Um, can I again call you to give us a wrap up? and closing remarks yeah you're welcome ma'am uh so thank you very much uh for being here uh and for being online and listening to this uh event um as rachel said we're at a point in time when this topic is uh critical because uh, having the impact from the investments that are made will uh, set the stage in terms of how uh, we feel the benefits of the investments. Uh, so this m message that was given in the beginning about uh, countries that perform well uh, versus countries that are performing at an average, getting 30% of the benefits of investment is, is important as a back, uh, background. Um, so I think what I wanted to do is just to say a couple of things uh, reflecting on what was said by the uh, two discussants uh, on the two parts of the report. Uh, the first one, I think, was uh, an important point that 80% of the economy is not um, uh, in the eye of the storm, if I can call it that, in terms of uh, the shocks that we're feeling from all the global uh, impacts, whether the pandemic or the, the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, but it means that the fact that they're outside the economy also means that we have to do more to bring them in into the fold. And uh, while government... Uh, did well at protecting the people during the COVID uh, period. Uh, late stimulus that was not well targeted may have prompted some resurgence of um, uh, people selling land, uh, moving into uh, the streets to vend uh, because of uh, the need to survive. So really finding ways to bridge the, the divide and uh, lend a hand to those who need it most through offering social protection um, uh, opportunities I think would be important. Um, so the fact that 30% of the population are entrepreneurs I think was also uh, brought out and uh, that this means better targeting in terms of who we provide um, uh, support to uh, rather than just a blanket support or a subsidy that affects the entire population. It needs better definition in terms of local content, value addition, and pricing in order to stimulate productivity. Um, for those who are in the um, high end, uh, so the sort of small, medium, and large scale businesses, uh, mitigating risks for lenders in order for them to access financing, but also, um, I think was mentioned during the, uh, uh, the question and answer period, the reducing the distortions so that uh, private um, sector um, uh, or banking sector rather can offer you know credit uh, to those who need it most will be important so better business planning for scale uh, and impact I think is critical um, the risk of Uganda becoming a slum unless better planned I think was also noted and uh, this uh, I think looking at uh, both the public transit and transport uh, issues but also looking at uh, ways to ensure that we, we absorb the population in rural areas into the economy so that they don't, by default, come to urban centers seeking a better opportunity. So inclusion of the poor in all of the activities uh, we are undertaking will be important. Um, finally, I think the point about um, uh, the commodity prices and their impacts on Uganda um, uh, so assessing really what what is driving inflation and trying to find ways to to mitigate those impacts 
Um, so that was the first half uh, of the presentation in terms of the response, and we appreciate very much uh, the points that Professor made. Um, a second half of the presentation, I think the point was made about additional, point, uh, additional things that are required to close the remaining gaps, and those gaps included the political interference and finding ways to improve project selection, uh, prioritization, uh, and um, uh, how do you say, um, commitment to doing a few things better rather than doing uh, thinly spread um, effort was, was made as well. Um, and a master plan that shows uh, what priorities uh, sh we should all collectively commit to, I think, as a, as a way forward. Um, I think a second point was made about, uh, you know, uh, the need to ensure that uh, address that we address corruption, and this was seen as a collective uh, effort of both the public and private sector and us as individuals. Uh, the impact being low on the quality of infrastructure, and uh, therefore O and M costs being higher, was also raised as a result of the corruption and the need for therefore uh, addressing or plugging this hole in order to have the funds to be able to uh, to to uh, um, uh, to when to have the funds to uh, to allow us to rehabilitate at a later stage and not early because of the uh, impacts on the um, the infrastructure from uh, poor construction um, and then the unit cost standardization is required. I think this, I think, is a point that has uh, been debated quite heavily over the uh, past. Um, it is these costs are actually costs that are regional, looked at at a regional level, but still require, of course, local analysis in order to uh, to come to a more scientific. Um, assessment. So trying to find ways to standardize the cost I think is critical for the, uh, how do you say, cross evaluation across projects in order to choose those have that are, um, uh, you know, most uh, impactful. So I think, uh, you know, what we need to do is to look at also the implications of, of uh, uh, some of the points that were made about uh, the Uganda um, progress towards middle income status. Uh, as I understood uh, uh, the questions from, from the audience, it was really about trying to uh, see how the World Bank measures uh, this. I wanted to just reflect also that um, moving into middle income status also has its has benefits but also has uh, downside in terms of the resources that are available to the country uh, from the outside. Of course, once you're a bigger boy, you don't need to have uh, your mother spoon feed you, if I can call it that. And I think once you're uh, a, a, an adult, you don't need to live in your parents' house. And I think these are things that we have to factor in, that we try to graduate countries out of the World Bank uh, they become IBRD, and that means they are only eligible for commercial resources once they are no longer um, low-income countries. Uh, and I think many of the development partners that contribute grant resources also do not provide the same level of resources to countries that are um, uh, lower um, middle income uh, or even middle income. So I think the, the transition will happen, uh, but it will need to be um, managed so that uh, once you take your, your foot off this stone, you'll be able to uh, you know, move on to the, the other stone without falling into the water. And I think that's where we try to, to see what we can do to bridge the gap, to provide the information about um, the risks globally that have to be factored into the equation for Uganda not to, to lose uh, resources that it might require at this difficult time uh, in order to get us quicker to the lower middle income status that uh, is uh, desired. So I think uh, I'll stop there and just say that it's been a very interesting discussion and we hope that it has been uh, brain, what did you say? 
<laughs> brain tickling and uh, that you have all uh, learned something from this discussion and that you'll also take the time to go through the publication to have the debates and to spread the word about the things that are important for us going forward. It will be a difficult time, but we do need to reflect on this and then to adjust our, our uh, behavior accordingly so that we can manage the, the difficult times. Thank you and uh, have a good afternoon. All right, thank you. Mukami Kuroki is a country manager for the World Bank. I hope you can join us for our Twitter space in the evening later on um, today. I just, just want to invite you all. Uh, we'll be having a Twitter space f uh, today evening. It will be hosted by the World Bank, but I'll be co-hosting it, so it could be more another opportunity to interact with people. Professor, you'll, I think, also be joining today. And Rachel will also be around. Margaret, I hope you can also join us on Twitter. <laughs> You're not being in defiance. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. A, a big thank you to everyone who turned up today. I just want to hand over the mic to Bernard who gave it to me. Bernard, thank you for the opportunity. Over to you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Solomon. Thank you, uh, everyone, the team up here. And um, a big thank you to all the uh, journalist friends in the house. I suppose there are some lingering questions. I think uh, there will be some moments to ask after we finish uh, formally. Um, I'm sending you the press release, um, Rachel's presentation, and a link to the report that's just been published online uh, in case. But we also have still have some physical copies if you don't have any and you want one please uh just say so we'll have we'll get you one thank you and thank you very much have a great uh, day and, and just to be sure the twitter spaces starts at 6 p.m 6 p.m thank you You want me to announce? Okay. No, no, I haven't yet. Okay, let me let me just WhatsApp it to you. I created.